Welcome everyone to our panel on the clinical care for people with Refsum's disease. Uh, my name is Christy DeMarco and I'm the founder and president of Global Dare Foundation and I'll be your moderator today. I'm honored to be here with both Dr. Florian Eichler and Dr. Radha Ramchandran. Uh, they're here to meet uh, to talk about um, the clinical care of people with Refsum's disease. And I'll, in a moment, I'll have them both introduce themselves. Before we get started, though, um, I wanted to share a little bit about Global, Fair, uh, Global Dare Foundation and provide a few uh, housekeeping details. So Global Dare Foundation was established in October of 2019. Uh, Dare stands for Defeat Adult Refsum Everywhere. And our mission is to promote worldwide awareness and better quality of life for all who are diagnosed with adult Refsum disease. You know, our goal is to support research, education initiatives, awareness campaigns like the one we're doing today, um, advocacy, uh, you know, driving research is at the center of what we do because we do dare to believe that there is a cure for adult Refsum's disease. You know, and Dr. Eichler and Dr. Radharam Chandran, um, you know, are supporting Global Dare Foundation, Foundation's mission, you know, by being valuable members of our medical and scientific advisory board. You know, with our medical and scientific advisory board, we are raising awareness for Refsum, you know, driving better treatment and care, and reinvigorating the research into better therapies. For Refsum's disease. Okay, now on to just a few housekeeping details. Obviously, everyone's in listen-only mode, uh, but this panel will be open for your questions. You know, to ask questions, you would just go to the right-hand panel um, on the side of your screen. You'd click the stage tab and then click Q&A, and you can type your question down below. Uh, and today's session will be recorded for later viewing on the Global Dare Foundation website and our YouTube channel. Um, all right, so now let's get started. Uh, so I'd like to start um, by having both um, Dr. Eichler and Dr. Ramchandran to do a brief introduction of themselves, give a little bit of background, you know, and how did they become, you know, engaged in rare diseases, you know, like Refsum's disease. So maybe uh, Dr. Ramchandran, do you want to get us started? Maybe Dr. Eichler, do you want to get us started? Sure. Can you hear me okay, Christy? Yep, I can hear you just fine. Um, so my name is Florian Eichler. I'm a neurologist at Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston, and I direct the leukodystrophy service there. Um, I originally got involved in neurogenetic diseases uh, during a fellowship at Johns Hopkins where I was fortunate to have the mentorship of Dr. Hugo Moser, um, who introduced me to the field of leukodystrophies and uh, inherited disorders. The thing that Hugo taught me is that it really takes a village of people to make progress. And uh, he, more than anyone, embodied the clinician scientist who put the patient and the patient plight front and center. Uh, he was always talking about what it meant to walk in the patient's uh, footsteps and feel their uh, suffering and their plight and their perspective. So I think um, that was a huge impetus for me to go into the field and make progress after uh, learning a lot of the biochemistry from uh, Dr. Moser and completing residency in neurology at Mass General. I um, then focused on gene therapy uh, for the leukodystrophies and making progress in the field of ex vivo uh, and antiviral gene therapy that um, was uh, just uh, favorably voted upon last week, um, but have started uh, gene therapy trials in a number of different disorders. And I'm absolutely delighted to be part of uh, DARE and uh, Boston Center of Excellence for Adult Refsum Disease. And this is really um, following the lead of Christy DeMarco, who's done such remarkable things here and helped us bring together many different uh, disciplines and experts to improve care and 
research for patients with adult draft sudden disease. I think it's still early days. We have so much ahead of us, um, but I'm extremely excited about the prospects and see so much uh, opportunity here. All right, uh, Dr. Ramchandran, do you want to go next? Do you have any different uh, disciplines and experts? Oh, I think, Rod, you there. need to, you need to close. Patients with disease. I think it's still early days. I think you have the stage tab open. You know, so you, uh, not the backstage tab, but you have the regular stage tab open on your screen, uh, on the top of your tabs on your browser. If you close that, you'll be all set. Perfect. <laughs> I'm Radha Ramachandran. I'm, uh, I trained in metabolic medicine, um, both at Imperial and at the Charles Dent uh, Metabolic um, Unit, and also at the Evelina Center for Inherited Metabolic Diseases. And I now uh, run the Inherited Metabolic Diseases Service at Guy's and St. Thomas's uh, Hospital. Um, <clears throat> so the Refsims Clinic was initially started at Chelsea and Westminster Hospital, as most of you know, by Professor Gibbard, who did quite a bit of re the early research and um, phenotyping in patients with Refsims. Um, and Professor Wasbeke was also involved uh, in that clinic. Um, so as a junior uh, consultant, I um, got involved with that clinic and um, the patients were then transferred over to Guy's and St. Thomas's as it was felt it would be a better um, setup uh, for looking after patients with refsims given all the other facilities we have uh, with regards to inherited metabolic um, diseases. I'm very grateful uh, for Christy for having founded uh, the DARE Foundation and for all the work that's gone into um, invigorating the research and uh, also to try and get new information about treating patients with refsims. And I'm really happy to be involved um, in this um, patient support group. Um, look forward to this evening and hopefully we will have more ideas and more thoughts on take back uh, to take back to our clinic uh, to see how we can improve care for patients with Refsum's disease. Great, thank you both uh, for that, that introduction. That was great. Um, so one of the things I'm really excited about, and there's some sort of, uh, maybe when you're both on, not on, you can put, go on mute, so I think there's some sort of echo. Um, going on. Yeah, there you go. Uh, so uh, one of the things I'm really excited about uh, in our collaboration in the Medical and Scientific Advisory Board is our, our goal to try to create treatment guidelines, because right now, as you both know, there are no published treat treatment guidelines for Refsum's disease. So maybe the two of you could talk about um, the work you're collaborating on relative to those guidelines. Obviously, there's gaps in knowledge too. So, as, as you're working along and talking about those, maybe you can talk about those gaps um, as well. Maybe, uh, Dr. Eichler, do you want to get started? Yeah, I think it's a great place to start um, because uh, treatment and care should be front and center uh, of, of our, of our um, work together. In an ultra rare disease where there's not much information, uh, I think the place that, to start is in, in, in looking back at the literature, so sort of an inventory of where we are. And that was the first step of uh, us working together here to understand what has been reported before, what is the extent of uh, clinical reports, the course of the disease, the symptoms, the signs, across different compartments. And gathering that uh, over the past uh, year together uh, with a very talented uh, student and working together with uh, Dr. Verbitsky and Ram, Dr. Ramachandran, we are not only understanding what has been reported on adult Refsim, but also where the gaps are. And I, I think seeing um, this entire spectrum of knowledge in the literature also reveals how much more work we have ahead because uh, there is a sense here that uh, 
many aspects of adult refsim and um, what patients are experiencing are still not being reported in the literature and need to be done more comprehensively, more rigorously, and also uh, in a more updated way. So is it still true what was reported 10, 20, 40 years ago today, as we know that medical standards have changed, um, our understanding of medical practice has improved, um, so it's it's important while we look back to understand where we are, and I'll let uh, Dr. Ramachandran speak to uh, her work with on, on surveys and and of course the incredible practice that she has in London. Radha, it looks almost like like you have. Um, yeah, I, I, I've got some, some sunshine. I'm so. The shutters down just one moment. It's the enlightenment coming through the window. Is that better? Sorry. Yeah. It's a tad bit better. It yeah. looks like you have, you know, the heaven shining down on you. So that's good, you know. <laughs> um, so thank you, uh, Dr. Akla, for that. Um, I totally agree. Um, we have um, also been reviewing the literature and I think uh, we will be collaborating with Dr. Eichler later on to share the information that uh, we've got. Uh, but as he pointed out, the phenotype of the patients who are presenting to our clinic now and who are being newly diagnosed is actually quite different from those who were diagnosed many years ago. and. Uh, the best way to learn is from our patients and following them up going forwards and looking at the changing phenotype and looking at the changing natural history of this disease will teach us a lot in terms of what early treatments can do in terms of preventing um, complications and also what difference diagnosing patients earlier will make in terms of how they present to us. So for instance, years ago, most of the patients who presented to our clinic with Refson's disease would have presented as a result of an acute decompensation and symptoms as a result of that. Uh, and therefore their <clears throat> symptoms and their the, the problems they present with are quite different to our newer patients who are presenting because they've been genetically diagnosed. And that would be very interesting for us to see when patients are in, put on treatment at the time of genetic diagnosis, what happens in terms of the symptoms that develop? Great. Uh, so I, I appreciate all the, the great work that's being done to, to assemble, you know, these treatment guidelines. I think it'll make a big difference uh, for patients. I know when I was first first diagnosed, you know, you would often think that people would know exactly, once you get a diagnosis, people would know exactly what to do with, do for you. Uh, but that's not really the case with rare diseases. And it's, it's so great to have a team that, you know, has experience in this disease wanting to help put together, you know, might not all be evidence-based treatment guidelines. We might have to work towards those evidence-based treatment guidelines, but collecting that natural history, you know, really learning from patients, uh, what's working well, what isn't working well, and then hopefully advancing more research, you know, that helps us to create those evidence-based treatment guidelines will be, will be important. Um, so one of the, one of the other questions uh, that I have, and I would recommend any in the, anyone in the audience that has questions, uh, you know, to feel free to submit them at any point in the chat. I'll continue to, to work through my list of questions, but I'd, I'd be happy to hear from the audience as well. Um, what would, uh, you know, as you see and talk with patients on a regular basis, what, what do you um, hear is the biggest complaint um, that you hear from people with Refsim's disease? And, and how do you work through that? Dr. Ramchandra, do you want to go first this time? Sure. Um, so what, when you say complaints, are, uh, I assume you mean what are the most sort of common problems that the patients present with? Um, so from our experience, I think the one problem that patients most often 
uh, sort of put on top of their list is their visual um, uh, function and, and actually ways in which we can improve that or delay um, deterioration in vision. That is probably the biggest and the most often uh, sort of um, described problem in our patient group. Is that, am I answering your question correctly? Is that what you were after? Yeah, I think ultimately um, understanding what are the, the dilemmas that patients are having to work through, you know, and are, you know, are, are there avenues? Obviously on a vision loss perspective, there's not much we can do other than to try to minimize our, our fatanic acid levels going up. Um, but, you know, are there other things that, um, you know, patients are presenting with as well that are, are, are a challenge um, that potentially have, you know, you found any resolution or um, are able to, to um, you know, prescribe an, an avenue that provides relief? I suppose the other other uh, biggest uh, challenge for patients with refsims, as you know, is a rare disease. And in terms of diagnosis, so many patients would have sort of suffered with their symptoms for many years before the diagnosis has been made. <clears throat> I think we have seen a visible uh, impact of their foundation on, on that because we have had a number of patients who have contacted us directly as a result of the work that DARE has done in terms of publicizing the, uh, the, the, the DARE Foundation and also actually increasing awareness of the condition. Um, and I think that that is a really important uh, part in the patient's journey in terms of being able to di be diagnosed earlier would be um, one. And the other one is easier access to um, blood tests and more, uh, you know, so that people are able to do it in a way that uh, involves as less uh, travel and makes it logistically easier to get blood tests done to monitor phytanic acid levels. Um, yeah, it seems, it seems as though phytanic acid tests are a challenge, uh, you know, in different countries have to present different challenges. I know in the US, I think just even having the, the, the physician understand what test to order, you know, is is a problem. Uh, and then once they determine what test it's orders, actually doesn't take like any lab can actually take the blood sample and ship it to the appropriate lab. Uh, but it sounds like that's not always the case. Um, from a uh, in in the UK as an example, I know many patients um, don't want to come into London, you know, to get their level done. So they'd like something similar to what I have. My my level gets done here in Maine. It gets shipped out to the Mayo Clinic or to Kennedy Krieger. It gets done there, and then they ship the results back. Um, so obviously, in different countries, it's a different approach. So hopefully, we can kind of tackle some of that as well. Any thoughts on your end, uh, Dr. Eichler? Yeah, no, I echo what uh, Dr. Ramachandran said about uh, the vision problems in in patients. That certainly is um, a, a a a chronic uh um problem that that uh, often in terms of the future prospect of of more vision loss it also contributes to uh an, an anxiety and concern as a neurologist i also see a lot of complaints around neuropathy and pain and coordination i think uh as um we need all elements and compartments of the nervous system for navigating our daily lives. This uh, is impacting patients um, when they're trying to walk, balance themselves. As night blindness sets in, that's of course contributing to, to coordination problems. Um, I think a big, question that patients have is how much of what I'm experiencing is Refsum disease and how much is not? And is everything that I'm seeing about myself uh, truly Refsum? And so I think there is still a lot that we need to learn here. We cannot simply attribute all symptoms to that genetic disease. And there might be new aspects uh, that we don't recognize right now that are part of the disease. And then there are others that are, are not part of it. And so 
Uh, the patient visit and that interaction with patients is so central in my mind because it's that exchange and that experience over time that teaches me uh, new things. And, and likewise, I hope that patients and families are, are experiencing and learning back through our, our um, medical resources. But um, I, I would say, you know, activities of daily living are central and here, you know, beyond vision, ataxia, coordination, balance, pain is, uh, I think, a huge issue. Thank you both for, for that. I think we do have one question so far coming in. It says, you know, so if a patient is compliant on the diet, exercises properly, avoiding, you know, fat burning, you know, metabolic stressors, you know, uh, manages their stress well, you know, keeps, um, uh, keeps well, yet their PA levels are high, you know, what do you recommend to get their levels down? Do you want to go for first, uh, Dr. Ramchandran? Oh, it looks like we lost Dr. Eichlund. <laughs> uh, I'll let you go first then. <laughs> so that's a really good question. And I think um, it is hard. Uh, you know, it, it is a diet that you need to comply with sort of day in, day out for the rest of your life. Um, and it can be pretty, um, you know, and, 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 you know, food has an impact on all aspects of our life, really, including our social life and feeling of, you know, quality of life and well-being. Um, <clears throat> it's a difficult question. Um, it really depends on what the levels are um, and what, uh, what the patient's symptoms are. So, for instance, in our service, if somebody was having high levels despite doing everything, then <clears throat> I think the first thing we do is to have a closer scrutiny of the diet in terms of, you know, as you know, um, it's not an exact science. Some of them are very high in phytanic acids. Some foodstuffs are not that high, but, uh, you know, there probably needs to be a limitation in terms of how much is consumed. And so it's a much more detailed scrutiny on the diet to see whether there is anything we can do to change um, um, the diet and whether that might have an impact. Um, we wouldn't automatically um, do a plasmapheresis unless, of course, there are acute uh, symptoms um, involved. Um, we might uh, see whether patients are having enough calories because that can have an impact on phytanic acid levels in terms of whether they are hypocaloric. Uh, <clears throat> And we might also see if there's an intercurrent illness. So, for example, you know, things like overactive thyroid sometimes can cause uh, people to be more catabolic and that can push phytanic acid levels up. Um, so it would be a, a much more detailed dietetic and um, clinical uh, review to see if there are any factors that are um, affecting the phytanic acid levels and trying to control those. Anything to add, Dr. Eichler? Yeah, sorry, I cut out briefly, um, but I, I, I think I heard most of what Dr. Ramachandran said. The, the, the only thing maybe to add is um, um, that understanding what's happening over time is key. So I think the holistic approach that Dr. Ramachandran mentioned is the way to look at it, understanding the levels in the context of the patient experience and signs and symptoms. I think one uh, has to be careful not to uh, simply um, look at just one aspect uh, or one lab alone, but put it into the context of, of the entire body so is that lab value trending up or trending down? Are the symptoms getting better, getting worse? What is the association between uh, the phytanic acid levels and uh, the well-being of the patient? And accordingly, you can uh, get an understanding of what degree of intervention is needed. Is this something that, uh, you know, more dietary restrictions can help with, or is this rising into a dangerous level where uh, there are also symptoms associated 
that would warrant being more aggressive and doing something like plasma phrases. Thank you. Uh, speaking of plasmapheresis, uh, you know, can you can you talk about um, that a little bit, and you know when you would consider using uh, plasmapheresis uh, as as part of a treatment for a person with Rasm's disease? Do you want to start, Dr. Ramchandran? Sure. Um, again, a very good question, and I don't think we really know the answers um, for sure. Um, because the evidence is is limited. Um, so I can only base it um, on um, our practice um, and also on the limited evidence that there appears to be in the literature. So in our practice, we would use plasmapheresis mainly if the levels were over a thousand uh, and if patients were presenting with acute symptoms, acute neurological symptoms, and were acutely unwell. Um, we wouldn't routinely use phytanic acid, uh, plasmapheresis to bring phytanic acid levels down um, if both those um, aspects weren't there. Um, there are some places where they do use plasmapheresis more regularly. I think the difficulty is in terms of understanding what the outcomes are that we are looking to achieve by doing these regular plasmapheresis. And plasmapheresis doesn't come without risks. There are risks involved with plasmapheresis, um, including impact on quality of life. Um, and, and so th that's, that's what our practice has been so far. Um, I don't know, what do you think, Dr. Eichler? Yes, I, I agree. I think, um, as you said, one has to put it into the larger context of what the patient is experiencing and what is happening over time. So, you know, it's a very different scenario. It's a, levels are trending up over time and, and moving into sort of that dangerous range where we would say, you know, 1,000 and above. And if there are associated symptoms that are occurring, is this an acute decompensation? Is this a situation where uh, somebody is uh, has a different altered state of alertness, is is uh, less responsive than before, are there more GI symptoms or other symptoms associated? So I think looking at this holistically, again, is important rather than saying there's a cutoff that, that you should uh, achieve before you would consider this. So I think this is not different than how we think about clinical practice in general. And we would certainly look at a diabetes patient in a similar way that we look at their glucose level or the HbA1c in a similar uh, um, contextual way. And so the other thing I guess I would also note is as you're performing a plasmapheresis, you know, you're changing levels of phytanic acid probably in blood compartment, who knows what's happening in other compartments of the nervous system or the eye where you actually want to see lower um, phytanic acid levels occur. And so I, I am a little hesitant to say, you know, there's one answer for one level in, 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 in the phytanic acid level of blood. And uh, one has to really have a thoughtful conversation with your healthcare provider uh, to understand risk and benefit and possible um, outcomes uh, that, that uh, this ensues. Great, thank you both for your uh, thoughts on that. Uh, all comes down to looking at the patient as the individual, right, and, and assessing that individual person's needs because we there are also people who have other other conditions outside of refsums as well that could contribute or need to be considered um, as as you consider the different treatment options, including plasmapheresis. Uh, so great. Um, another question came in. You know, is there a test that can measure how much botanic acid we can metabolize? You know, we know that. Um, omega oxidation is the pathway that we can use to um, oxidize phytanic acid. But is there any test to allow us to know how much can actually go through that pathway? Uh, 
I think the answer is no, but <laughs> I don't think there, I don't think there is, but um, uh, I'll, I'll even, I'll, I'll, I'll let either one of you uh, confirm my, my thought on that, but. Uh. <laughs> um, so, so I, you're right. I think that there isn't a clinical test that, um, that, uh, that will allow us to, 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 to determine that. Um, there are some, uh, there has been publication and Professor Visbeke has done some work previously many years ago on omega oxidation and measuring levels of compounds in the urine to see uh, what extent uh, phytanic acid is getting metabolized by that pathway. But there isn't a validated clinical assay that's available that we can reliably use. Um, and the other thing to say is, um, a lot of the time when mutations happen, genetic uh, um, uh, conditions, and we know from other genetic conditions that it's not like an on-off on switch. Um, so sometimes the enzymes can be completely switched on or off, and sometimes there might be uh, you know, residual function. And it's possible that that's true in refsins too, uh, but we don't have any reliable ways of measuring that. Um, and we mostly have to rely on patients' presentations really too to understand whether somebody's phenotype is more severe or less severe. Great. Uh, another question I have for you all, are there any um, other medications we should avoid as um, that could potentially increase botanic acid levels? Uh, not that we know of, and I'm, I'm glad to have Dr. Ramachandran also weigh in um, you know, obviously, we we know of certain foods and uh, meat and fish that uh, can increase your phytanic acid levels. You know, if there is ever any question around certain supplements that are, um, you know, utilizing fish oil or, or meat uh, ingredients or gelatin that you want to uh, avoid those. But even there, I think the contribution is pretty marginal. Um, but I think uh, just with this knowledge of sensitivity to any compounds uh, or dietary aspects that increase phytanic acid, it's prudent to look at supplements um, um, more carefully and, it's, and it's their composition. But in terms of medications, uh, there's nothing that we know of um, that is uh, contraindicated in, in Refsim at large. I would say if you yourself experience uh, certain reactions to medications, it's always good to discuss that with your physician. Um, you want to understand whether that's just your individual uh, reaction or whether it has any relationship to Refsim. I think that's always uh, the first thing to do is not automatically attribute everything to um, Repsim, but uh, carefully understand the relationship uh, between the specific gene defect and how you feel and function. And I think the phytanic acid levels um, are, are a good tool to help uh, address any questions here. They're not a perfect tool, but they are a tool. Yeah, I think um, it, it'll be interesting as we as we dive into more research into the future. I know, you know, one of the things that, um, you know, Professor Wanders has looked at in the past is the ability to potentially up upregulate omega oxidation, the omega oxidation pathway, you know, with a with a drug. Um, and you you wonder whether there's also the ability to reduce the the um, the uh, oxidation through that pathway as well. So maybe it doesn't directly increase you know PA levels, but could there be a you know an abil a reduced um, ability to um, to oxidize phytanic acid, you know, through that pathway, depending upon medicine. So we don't know, you know, there's lots we don't know about this disease, we know. <laughs> and that's yeah. why we want to do more research. Uh, I think, and I, I do think, uh, Dr. Ramchandra, and I think if, if I'm right, uh, ibuprofen is one of those ones that might be suspected as something that um, re reduces the ability to, 
to process phytanic acid. Um, and so I think patients are generally advised not to use ibuprofen. Uh, yeah, so, so so we've 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 sort of reviewed reviewed the literature around this. We've looked at it, um, we've looked at, um, discussions um, about it um, as well. So ibuprofen gets metabolized by a path uh, through that same pathway as phytanic acid, but much lower down the metabolic pathway, and therefore we don't actually think that there is a significant impact on the metabolism of phytanic acid in patients with refsins. Um, there is one case report that's been published in the literature a while ago about a patient who was unwell after taking ibuprofen. But uh, reading that case report in detail, there are actually many other contributing factors to that patient becoming unwell um, other than ibuprofen. Um, I think the caveat that I'd like to add is, at least in the UK, our patient popula population is older um, uh, patients. And so, you know, the, 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 the usual risks involved with taking ibuprofen should be borne in mind. Um, and obviously, as with any other medications, it's always advised that patients discuss it with their consultant uh, before they take it both in terms of dose and frequency. Um, so our advice for reference patients would be the same as for anybody else with their age and other comorbidities in terms of what they can and can't take with regards to ibuprofen. Uh, Dr. Eichler, would you agree with that? Yeah, I, I think, uh, um, as you mentioned, the, the the only only place that the ibuprofen has come up before is in amacor deficiency and that's you know i'm not um something applicable to uh, most patients here you know the compared to fasting diet infection it seems like the big contributors uh here uh, um, that could trigger uh, setbacks are, are more important than than uh, any medications. But if you're on multiple different medications and there is a situation of polypharmacy, I think you know patients with adult breast are, are vulnerable, and you should probably be discussing that carefully with uh, your providers. There are other lipid disorders that affect the nervous system, such as uh, late onset Tay Sachs and Sandoff disease, where we do know that there are uh, there is a sensitivity to certain antipsychotics and medications that should be avoided. I don't know of that in adult Refsin disease, but I think there is precedent, Christy, to a situation where we might in the future learn something like that. Yeah, it's probably more even you know points to the need for those natural histories you know of patients and understanding how. You know, you know, just what they're taking for medications, how their symptoms ebb and flow, where, where their PA levels go, you know, being able to actually look at all of that data and really understand, you know, what, what are the potentials, right? Um, we'd learn a lot from just collecting natural histories of the, the patients that we do have, right? Without even doing any mouse model studies, you know, just, just collecting that data alone. And that's why we obviously started our patient registry and hopefully we'll, we'll be looking to start um, some additional studies that will, will help us gain some of that, that insight. So definitely a place where the patients can play a strong role in, in, in giving us really valuable information to, to drive better care. Right and be able to improve our quality of life. So, um, so we need those patients to uh, to help us get there. So, uh, so one more question uh, for you, and then I think we're we're, we're at time. Um, is uh, there was a question around uh, you know around the typical type of tests that uh, a pa person with Rothschild's disease uh, should take? And you know, based upon your prior comments, I think. It, you know, probably probably the answer is individual, um, but may, maybe maybe the thought would be when someone is first diagnosed. If we maybe flavor it from that perspective, when someone is first diagnosed, you know, is there is there some standard around um, 
what what should be evaluated up front to kind of understand what are some of the, some of the potential concerns or or things that should be tracked on a regular basis. Um, I'll just, I'll stop there and see. Dr. Eichel, do you want to do you want to go first? Uh, sure. So the obvious test is uh, both the uh, you know phytanic acid and level and the uh, genetic test, and let's assume that you know you're now have evidence that you have adult Refson disease. So what are the next tests that should be uh, conducted? Um, and uh, um, I would say, you, you know, you should check your phytanic acid level at least once a year, probably more frequently if your levels are high or your levels are trending uh, uh, upward. Um, and that might vary it by where you live and, and how close to a center you are. Um, and uh, But we will always get a baseline MRI. We'll look at nerve conduction studies to assess your peripheral nerve. Um, we will perform audiology, um, do um, lab work to assess organ function, uh, liver and kidney. So I think... Uh, those are the baseline tests you should get done once you have um, evidence of adult Refson disease. And then based on your own symptoms and the findings on these different tests, uh, you will have follow-up. And that dictates you know, the frequency with which you should uh, be seen and the frequency with which these tests should be repeated. As you said, Christy, not one size fits all. I think it's important to understand that best care is individualized care. It's, uh, it, it would be great if we were all alike, but in some ways it would be also terrifying. So um, I think it is good to know that um, we are different and accordingly we need to um, have a, have a visit with our physician to uh, understand where the priorities are and what are the things that need to be highlighted. But we do understand uh, from this genetic diagnosis that there are certain parts of our body that are at risk. Um, and I, I may not have I mentioned in the beginning, but it's, it was so obvious to me that that vision is also front and center here. So having that um, regular eye exam is, is, is critical. Dr. Ramachandran? T totally agree um, that, uh, you know, with, with the baseline test, that's exactly what we would do as well. The only uh, comment uh, to add is that um, sometimes patients come into clinic and somebody else is doing the weights and then it's not been done and then we don't have them done. So it's one of those things to just make sure that a weight is done so that we're tracking the weights and because we know that that's the biggest risk in terms of sort of changing levels and phytanic acids. Great point. Yeah, no, it's sometimes it's the obvious things that are so important. Well, thank you. And I think, you know, what's what's great, too, is that, you know, both um, Dr. Eichler and Dr. Ramchandran, you know, are part of, um, you know, the Global Dare Medical and Scientific Advisory Board. And, you know, we, you know, we're bringing all of these different clinicians and researchers together, and they're talking to one another about Refson's disease. And really, the, the, we're learning from each other as we go, right, sharing different case information and you know and what's working well here what's what's working well there um, so I think the more the more we come together and understand what patients are going through patients share information um, we'll be in a better place and so uh, now we're, we're at time so I'm going to thank you both um, for uh, being part uh, of this panel answering all these um, uh, very important questions, you know, and just for your ongoing engagement. I mean, I uh, have the pleasure of working with both of you on a regular basis and it, it truly is a pleasure um, to have two, you know, two foremost experts, you know, um, you know, working with us on a regular basis. And I, I know together we can, can definitely make a, a difference um, and impact on patient lives. So I appreciate that. And I appreciate the one and the folks that attended on the on the call today, and uh, for your great questions. 
And so that that ends uh, today's panel. And uh, I hope everyone can join us on our, our next panel about the patient experience. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Because without your efforts, none of this would have been possible. So thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that. All right.